From being the youngest minister, Honorable Ranil Vikramasinghe has held numerous portfolios to be the Prime Minister of the country four times. His political resilience and experience shows the strength of a leader. The Prime Minister holds a pivotal role as Sri Lanka embarks on this transformational journey. We would now like to invite Honorable Ranil Vikramasinghe to address the gathering. Venerable members of the clergy, Honorable Ministers, the Mayor Colombo, Mr. and Mrs. Pathpan, distinguished grades and friends. Let me first congratulate all the firms, the top 25 firms that have gone up, that have got the awards. Some of you have gone up, some of you have come down a notch or two. That's a part of the game. Like the Minister of Finance, myself, Minister of Tourism, rest of us have noticed that we have also gone up a notch or two this year. Best of all is my colleague, uh, Sarat Fonseca, who in his own profession has gone beyond the five stars and become a field marshal. First and foremost, we must apologize for being late. But I said one condition which I had uh, told Marty, if I come, I won't be able to spend too much of the time. Because at the moment, we are busy trying to ask your question, answer your question, what have you been doing after you were elected? Well, we've had an election in between, but we are confident that we'll have a political agenda in place and that we will be able to initiate all the major political programs, some will take a bit of time to be concluded, by November 21st, the day President Maitripala Sirisena announced that he was going to be a common candidate and the United National Party Working Committee backed the decision. So that political agenda of which the 19th Amendment and getting the UN resolution passed the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the two of the most important ones, has still more work to be done, including constitutional amendments, a new constitution, and as the president announced today, he's been calling for the abolition of the executive presidency. I won't say here what we are going to do, but the uh, president, Maitripala Sirisena, will make the announcements on 21st of November so that we would have finished the major items on our political agenda, which leaves the next part, that's the economic agenda and development. Today, as some of the speakers mentioned here, we are the top corporates who can have a critical eye on their own performance and the performance of the others. Now, my job here, and of the presidents and of the cabinet, is to have a critical eye on Sri Lanka's performance so far. It's not too reassuring, because we have found that our revenue has fallen to 10.7% of the GDP. Our ratio of export earnings to the GDP has come down. Our ratio of debt has gone up. What is worrying are also the international developments. If you look at your export earnings, manufactured earnings, they've all come down. It's only the foreign employment remittances that have in increased. Now, what has happened as of yesterday, the Middle East is going to become a battleground. Let's hope there is no major incident which could result in numbers of people having to return to Sri Lanka. They keep our fingers crossed and hope those incidents are avoided. And the Middle East is also the global center for 
fuel production, both oil and natural gas. We are also affected by one of our major export earners, tea, which has lost its major markets, both in the Middle East as well as in Eastern Europe. But also alarming is the fact that we are losing our competitiveness. Today's economy is not what we faced in 1977 or 2001 or 2005 or 2010. Globalization has taken place and this in turn has been affected by the financial crisis of 2008. But within it you find top performers, one of which will be Vietnam. If the Trans-Pacific Partnership comes into place, and that depends a lot on what the US Congress will do next year or year after, you would find that Vietnam will get a reputation for being one of the most competitive economies in Asia, even rivaling that of China. Even without the Trans-Pacific Partnership, Vietnam has become competitive and is becoming the center for manufacturing. So we have lost our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis some of our other Asian-friendly countries. On the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, there is a low-wage base emerging in the Bay of Bengal with Bangladesh and Myanmar. Myanmar will take a bit of time to settle down after the elections, but nevertheless, those two will become the low-wage bases, manufacturing bases. Where do we fit ourselves in? And from being a member, from being an export economy, sending out uh, manufactured goods, Today, we have to become a part of the global value chain. Now, this is what we have to prepare for. While I have painted a gloomy picture, it doesn't mean that we have to go down. Within it, there are nations that can come up and make themselves strong. This is where Sri Lanka has to fit itself into. And there are the decisions which we have to take in the coming few months in the course of next year. Firstly, how do we join the global value chain? How do we remove the numerous one-stops and ensure we come up on the ease of doing business? And finally, we've got to stop substituting tax exemptions and tax holidays for competitiveness. If you have to face competitiveness, let's see what we have to do increase our performance. We have to become, we have to move out of being a low-wage economy into a, as we are middle-income economy, also a high-wage economy. We have to enter our own free trade agreements. At the moment, the government is discussing with the EU the removal of the ban, EU ban on fisheries. We made significant progress, which will enable us now to start discussing somewhere early part of next year, the ability to regain the GSP plus. We have to think of an economic and technological agreement uh, with India, with China. We have to think, have another one with Singapore and start negotiating for a free trade agreement with the United States. So competitiveness is essential. And to become competitive is a task which you undertake, and not merely in manufacturing, not merely in services, upgrading the skills of those who go for foreign employment, and turning around the rural economy. So we have a fair number of ministers who are attending to this task, beginning with the uh, 
Minister of Finance. Then we have the Minister for Development uh, Strategy and International Trade. The Minister for Tourism, which is one of the short-term gains, medium-term gains, we can have one of the sectors. We have a Minister of Primary Industries, which is to ensure that the rural economy becomes export-oriented and competitive. We can't do it overnight. So some segments have to become competitive. Then the Ministry of Plantation Industries, Agriculture, Fisheries, the rural economy. They are all involved in making the economy perform better. Backed up by the Minister for Megapolis and Western Development, its ambitious plan of converting the Western province into a highly urbanized area, the Minister of Southern Development, who got to handle both the issues of uh, Hambantota Development, the rest of the South, and the Minister for Northwest Development, who is Vibe Development, the major road to Kandy and Dambulla will go through Vibe, opening it up. On the other hand, there will be economic zone coming all the way down into the Ulapiti. So these are the tasks that they have to perform. Not looking at the fact that we are planning out Trinkamali and the Kandy City. On the other hand, a key to a competitiveness is the education system. A recent World Bank survey on Sri Lanka's education system, I think released last week, if I'm not mistaken, has pointed out the fact that there has been a drop in the quality of education. The numbers going through vocational, technical, and university education are still small. And there is a big mismatch between the job market and the post-secondary education sector to the extent that our short-term bottleneck for development are the skills and vocational training. So we've got to focus short-term on creating the skills and creating the vocationally trained people, while in the medium term, we look at improving the quality of our education, both secondary, primary, secondary, as well as post-secondary. So these are the major challenges on which we are focused now that we have decided on the political agenda. And the next years, we'll see uh, us bringing out the policies and mobilizing all your support to go ahead. While Sri Lanka's business sector and the corporates have become more competitive, all our resources are insufficient for a rapid economic development of Sri Lanka. If you are to look at Sri Lanka as becoming a platform, as I've mentioned many times earlier, competitive value addition, logistics center, we do require the foreign investment. That money is available. We have to ensure that we carry out our next generation economic reforms and that we can attract that investment to Sri Lanka. It is certainly going to be a challenge which we can't run away from. As I mentioned earlier, this is not the bliss global situation as far as the global economy is concerned to embark on economic reforms, but nevertheless, there are many bright spots, and let us make Sri Lanka one of those bright spots. So I thought I'll mention to you in short what we are planning to do and what we are thinking of, what we have done, because far as we are concerned, it's not so much talking on what we are going to do, but do what has to be done and talk about it later. So I hope we have the support of all of you as we venture out on this, to face this new challenge. So again, congratulations to the winner, and thank you for having invited me.